Now, it was brought to my attention last week that uh, I, I can't do math. Fortunately, I met with Libby. She learned this week that three plus one equals four, and so she helped me understand that two plus two equals four. Now, I don't go off the cuff often, and so last week I said two plus two equals two, and I, I, looked, at, I looked out and I saw people laughing, and I, and I go, I, that wasn't funny. <laughs> but really what was going on is you're going, his math is off. <laughs> like, y'all know you can talk, right? Do a buzz or something. Help a brother out. I do know now, thank you to Libby, that two plus two does in fact equal four. So... Praise God, yet another miracle. Now, there, there are not many times when we look in Scripture where we see God bow up against other gods. We, we see this happen with Elijah in 1 Kings 18. But we also see him challenge the gods of Egypt throughout the Exodus. That's what the plagues were. They were not some random events that God performed for no purpose. No, each plague was an attack against Egyptian gods or God. And so God shows that he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And these so-called gods who are worshipped by the people, they obey him and him alone. In fact, what God is really showing is that they're not gods at all. He's proving that he alone, God of Israel, is the only God. Isaiah 45, first part of verse 5, he says, I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. The Hebrew word for plague means to strike, to hit, a strong blow or death blow. So we can read this in the ten plagues that they are the ten strikes against the Egyptian gods. And so let's lay the groundwork. I'm going to be reading Exodus 3, 1 through 12. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. That's probably going to end badly. All right. I'll just fall off the stage. It's no big deal. All right. So he was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then the Lord said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off, for you are for your for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good land and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of, of Israel out of Egypt? And, he, and God said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, the Lord shall, they shall serve God on this mountain. Now we need to note verse 8. So the promised land is currently inhabited by these people. Now, though this series is on the Exodus, we are not covering the conquest of the promised land, but this is a point of contention with skeptics. So I'm going to go off on a bunny trail for a moment and address some of these. One of the objections brought up by the skeptics is that God's command to annihilate these people through war is unjust. And so there's a few points to be made here. If you recall, as God called Moses, he said, I'm the God of your 
forefathers, and he names them off. First one is Abraham. Well, God interacts with Abraham even before he was Abraham. I know there's name changes in the Bible, but he was named Abram, and then he was called Abraham. But in Genesis 15, 13 through 16, God says this, God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Okay, we're talking about Egypt. Where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom, uh, whom they will serve. And afterwards, they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now here's what we need to understand. God does not just give the promised land to his people. Instead, they are taken as slaves because of their disobedience to God. So why not just give them the promised land now? Well, it's because of verse 16. The iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So God is going to judge these nations, but their sin is not yet accomplished. God is a just and holy judge. He's not going to judge them without justification. But he's also not going to rain down judgment like Sodom and Gomorrah. No, he's going to use his people as the instrument of his judgment. And I find it funny because God waits 400 years from Abraham to Moses. That's a long time. Far beyond what he needed to. With one sin, man deserves to die. But God waits 400 years. Now what's going on during these 400 years? You know, just the basic sins of a depraved nation. Incest, prostitution, adultery, murder, idolatry, and the list goes on. To give like a real modern day example, uh, America. But this is what makes their sin unique in the sense of its depravity. It's found in their idolatry. And it is their child sacrifice. When a child was sacrificed to Baal, there was an altar where the, the, the idol had his arms stretched out. And if I'm aware, I think there's, there's two variants of it, which is the arms are stretched out or the arms are stretched out with a plate connecting them in between. But this idol was heated. And what they would do is they would bring their child and place the, uh, the child in the arms of, a, of the heated idol. And they would watch as their child was being fried to death alive. They would bang their drums to try and mask the cries of the child. But they would sacrifice their child to this idol. And God waits 400 years he gives them 400 years to change, to turn from their sin. But with every added generation, the depravity ensues. Skeptics will argue that God is unjust in his command to wipe these people out. And there are three points to be made here. First, God waited 400 years. That is a long time to change, and they didn't. Second, one could make the same argument from inside the city. Why hasn't God done something? When is God going to intervene? When is God going to step in? And lastly, when these battles took place, we see that there's fair warning to the nations about to be taken over. Many times they would either evacuate altogether, they would either cut their losses and leave it to them, or they would let the women and children flee while the men stayed behind and fought. We also know by Scripture not everyone was killed. But there's still plenty that we can cover, but that's not the focus of the sermon. Following the ten plagues, God's going to use Israel as an instrument of his judgment. And he is justified in the judgment that he levies on these nations, that Israel take over. But right now, as we are reading the Exodus, they are currently slaves in Egypt, and God must rescue them. God calls Moses to be his messenger and be the leader of his people. And so the first plague we see is the water into blood. And that's where we pick up in Exodus chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over all their reservoirs of water, that they may become blood. 
And there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up his staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. Now the first plague affected various sources, but the greatest was the Nile River. The river is truly the lifeblood of Africa, especially Egypt. If you even see Egypt on the map now, you see that it's a desert region, yet around the Nile it is vibrant and full of vegetation. The Nile was the sole source of livelihood for the, for the Egyptians. Its crops were irrigated by it. Its fields depended on the fertile soil that would, that would come as it, as it flooded every year, and so it would bring a new layer of fertile topsoil. The Nile was also the primary highway for trade and commerce. Now what we do know is that drinking water was not taken away completely. Exodus 7.24 says, So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. So understand, these plagues are not just going to affect Egypt. They are, in, in fact, going to also affect his people. And so for God to take away all the water from everyone including his people, which would have devastated them, that doesn't really make sense. We also know that there must have still been water available because of verse 22, when Pharaoh calls in the magicians to duplicate. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now notice, they didn't reverse what's been done. No, they they simply tried to duplicate it in some kind of knockoff way on a smaller scale through the dark arts. What did the magicians produce? We don't know. See, the Hebrew word for blood means blood, but it also means the color of blood, which is red. That has led some scholars to wrongly look to natural explanations for this miraculous event such as the red clay washing in from Ethiopia, which is a common occurrence, or the accumulation of red plankton similar to that of Queensland coast. These interpretations must be rejected because it was not just the Nile that was affected. Verse 9 tells us that water in containers turned to blood. Now, though we don't know exactly if it was blood, which if it was, it would have been pretty cool to test what blood type that was, Or if the emphasis was on the color. Regardless, we know that the life of the fish, the crops, the drinking water, etc., that was going to be affected. But the magicians have created knockoffs before. If you look earlier in the chapter, in Exodus 7, looking at verses 8 through 12, heads up to the computer, I'm going to go ahead and just plow through this, I'm not going to read it. So they throw down their staff, Aaron throws down his staff. It turns into a serpent. The magicians come in. We don't know how many there were. They do the same, and they, their staffs become serpents. But what's interesting is Aaron's staff eats all of theirs. But, you know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter that that happened. They were able to duplicate it in some form or fashion. They could do in some way, at least in their own minds, duplicate what God was doing. Now, of course, God was suckering them in. They think that they can keep up. They think that their gods can stack up against the God of Israel. God's just baiting them, and they took it. But even in this baiting, what we are seeing is that God is still greater. God's snake eats all of theirs. God turns billions of gallons of water to blood, and they turn one. As long as it can be duplicated in any way possible... Even if all they did was pour red Kool-Aid into it, oh yeah, it's red. It's duplicated. It's the same in their mind. But the God of the Bible, they can't, if they do this, if they're able to duplicate it, to create some sort of knockoff, then it allows them to stay where they are and not submit their life to the God of the Bible. Now, I want you to remember this because we're going to come back to it. But let's talk about some of the so-called gods which were, you know, got their bottoms publicly spanked. Knum, 
the Egyptian god of fertility associated with water and procreation. Another god, Happy, was responsible for the annual flooding of the river. They believed this god would flood the Nile, which would bring in new topsoil to fertilize the land every year. He was also honored by, as the god of fish, birds, and marshes, which is why he's often depicted with marshes on his head, or uh, uh, what was it, uh, marsh plants on his head or surrounding him. One of the Egyptian gods uh, was also Osiris, one of their greatest gods, and this was the god of the underworld. The Egyptians viewed the Nile as his bloodstream. And lastly, the god Hetmetit, was the guardian goddess of fish and fishermen. And so this plague, as well as the other plagues, we'll see that they show that these so-called gods of Egypt were powerless against the God of Israel. They couldn't stop Yahweh from turning the blood into, or the Nile into blood. But this plague was also a judgment, as, as though God was judging the gods of Egypt. At face value, it might seem like this plague went too far. God's taking drinking water from people, and these people are simply innocent bystanders of Pharaoh's hardened heart. But we need to understand that God is a just God. Now, why would he choose to turn the Nile to blood? If we, if we look at Exodus 1, verse 22, it says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born of Israel... You are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. The Egyptians killed thousands of helpless Israelite children. They tossed them in the Nile to drown or to feed the crocodiles. The Egyptians sought the blood of the Hebrews. And God is essentially responding, if you want blood, I'll give you blood to drink. And their gods could not stop him. Now the best that they could do was to create a knockoff, staffs that appeared as snakes but were eaten, water that appeared as blood but it wasn't. But this is all Pharaoh needed. It didn't matter that his snakes were eaten or that his land was turning to blood. As long as he had something that looked anything like what God was producing, he could stay where he was. We know that because of verses 13 and 22 of chapter 7. Now why is this so important? Because we would rather accept a knockoff than worship God. The easiest knockoff to accept in a postmodern world is universalism. I mean, how can there only be one path to God? How? And here's why. Because every faith has what we call truth claims. These truth claims separate that faith from the others. Even to say that all paths lead to God is itself a truth claim. And so by saying all paths lead to God, you must then justify how do you know that all paths lead to God? Now if that is true, then we should see truth claims across the board of every religion that are the same. But we don't. In fact, the truth claims of religion are what separate faiths not unify them. Two examples. Muhammad said in Surah 46, 9, he says, Tell me, I am not the, messen I am not the first messenger of the messengers, and I do not know what shall be done with me or with you. I follow only what is revealed to me, and I am nothing but a plain warner. Now there's no doubt that this is what bred the teaching that martyrdom for the sake of Islam, would guarantee you eternal life. After all, your very own prophet says, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And so if there's a way that I can be guaranteed eternal life, then I will do it. And so Islam spread by the sword and conquest. So it began the teaching of, if you die in battle, you are martyred, then you are going to heaven guaranteed. Well, what happens when the conquest stops? You simply expand the word of jihad. And once again, you're able to die for your faith and be guaranteed eternal life, even though Muhammad himself had no clue. Now that's one side of the, that can go one side to the extremism of you just don't know, there's no assurance in your salvation. That can be one direction. But the other direction 
is moral fundamentalism. But what kind of irritates me, as we look at the first one, where we say all paths are leading the same direction, are we seriously going to be so naive as to say someone who would take their own life and innocent others is going the same direction as you and me? They might be taking that violent, abusive route, but they're going the same way. Are we seriously going to say that? No, I'm saying they're going down. They're not going up. But you go the other direction of moral fundamentalism, and you have, for example, Mormons. They're, 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 people constantly tell me they're very moral individuals. They do good things. Well, then they must be right. There must be fruit there, right? Second Nephi 25:23 says, "For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also the brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do." Now that sounds a little bit like Ephesians 2:8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That comma in Christianity and that comma in Mormonism communicates something very different. Christianity says you are saved by grace through faith, comma, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. But 2 Nephi says you are saved by grace, comma, after all that we can do. Do you know what that says? It says that the cross of Jesus Christ wasn't enough. That you have to earn, prove, and work your way to fill in the gap of what Christ was unable to do. It says that the cross wasn't sufficient. That apparently when Christ said it is finished, it wasn't. And that is the root of morality. Earn it, perform, prove it. Different path, same destination, right? A knockoff is not the real thing. Now, Grant, don't lie. We've all bought store brand. Fruit circles are way cheaper than Fruit Loops. All right? I got it. But whether it's the Nile to blood or religion itself, Romans 1 addresses why people very clearly share a universal morality regardless of faith or lack thereof. God says, I have written it on your hearts. And when you go down the truth claims of the various religions, you see drastic differences, not unifying similarities. There's only one God, and it is the God of the Bible, and he is proving this through the Exodus. The second plague, I hate frogs. I get all like the woman in Tom and Jerry when she sees the mouse. Exodus 8, 1 through 3 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come out and go into your house and into your bedroom and into your bed and into the houses of your servants and and on your people and in your ovens and in your kneading bowls. Large numbers of frogs would not necessarily have been uncommon. The Nile has plenty of marshes and it's a perfect breeding ground, but obviously this plague was different. Frogs were considered a manifestation of the goddess Hecate, goddess of birth. Hecate was depicted with the head of a frog and the body of a woman. Also in the court of Happy, there are included crocodile gods and frog goddesses. The primordial god Kek was depicted as a man with a frog's head. Frogs were viewed as sacred in Egypt because they lived in what they believed were two worlds, in water and on land, meaning that they could both dwell in the Nile and out, meaning that they could cross between both worlds of life and death. They were considered so sacred that accidentally killing one could lead you to to the punishment of death. Now notice two great ironies here. Hecate was supposed to be the goddess who controls birth, but in this plague, millions of frogs were overflowing the land, so clearly the frog birth rate was out of control. We just learned that to accidentally even kill one would lead you susceptible to death, 
Well, how could that be avoided now? There were frogs all on the ground, frogs in the houses, in the beds, in the cooking ovens, and frogs in their bowls. The Egyptians could literally not walk without stepping on a frog and squashing it. But in doing so, they were violating their own laws and sentencing themselves to death. And this kind of goes back to the previous point about knockoffs. God was making the Egyptians guilty by their own law. Not only was he judging them and their gods, but he was also making them guilty under their own beliefs. And this is the same for us. As Christians, we need to have some self-awareness. We don't live up to the moral standard. As Christians, we fall short every single day. And that is why we need God's grace. And that is why he gives it freely. As non-believers who make their own morality, they still don't live up to it. Now, I will say it. I am a hypocrite, and I am in need of God's grace. 1 John, 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In our great hope of verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Christians, we have no room to be self-righteous. We're all hypocrites in need of grace. But don't be foolish. So is this world. Though they may make their own moral standard, they still don't live up to it. They too are hypocrites in need of grace. God is taking the laws of the Egyptians and making them guilty by their own measuring stick. Why would God do this? Exodus 23, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. 34, 14, You shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now we read this word jealous and we think of a, we get PTSD of a possessive ex. Maybe you are the possessive ex. God knows that these other gods are false. They may make us feel secure in our flesh, but it still leaves our soul dried out. These gods may make us feel good, but they do not transform. We might see morality in their life, but it is a fruitless morality. Perform, serve, work. Then God might show his affections towards you. That's not transformative. At best, that's behavioral modification or behavioral management. Do you know what is transformative? When we perform, serve, and work because we already have the affections of God. Take my wife. If I wake up every day and my goal is that I serve and, and, and try and earn her affections, then our marriage is a farce. But instead, no, I wake up to seek and serve and love and help because I've already been given her affections. The outpouring of my heart is not that I would gain her affections. The outpouring of my heart is a result of already her giving me her love. Do you see the difference? One is transformative. The other is simply behavioral management. And the transformative love we've seen within Christianity, that is transformative. You see, the faith, there are faiths that will tell you you need to earn it and work and prove yourself, and then maybe God will love you. We see this even within Mormonism. We see this within Islam. We see this within every other sect, even the ones who try and piggyback Christianity. Earn it, and then maybe God will reciprocate. But the message of the gospel is exactly the opposite. The message of the gospel is that, no, he first loved us, and upon that love we submitted to him. And it's through that love that you see the fruit of the Spirit flourish. That is fertile soil in which God grows in the heart of the, of the converted. That is the soil which God gifts and, and, and grows and cultivates in the life of the believer. But the soil that is based upon the earning and working is like trying to plant it in dry ground without any means of cultivating it. Now, as we close, I do want to address a little bit more about the jealousy of God. Because his jealousy is, is not abusive or domineering. Though God does not take kindly to 
God's taking his children away from him, his expression of jealousy is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. That God was so jealous of our worshiping knockoffs that he didn't rain down his wrath on us. No, God became flesh and God rained down his wrath on him. His jealousy manifested in the taking on of our flesh, in bearing our sin, enduring our punishment, receiving our death, conquering our grave to save us. To save us from the sin of our flesh, to rescue us from enduring our own punishment, to save us from death. These are the truth claims of Christianity. No other faith makes such truth claims. No other religion has God who empathizes with us, who died for us to save us. No, there's only one who says this. So don't settle for a knockoff when the truth has already lived, died, and resurrected. Don't sell yourself short for a fruitless faith when there's already one that will transform you, and that is in Jesus Christ. Don't pursue a God who you cannot experience when there's already one who has promised to indwell you and gift you. Don't chase after a God that you'll never know, a God you'll never know their affections for you or the eternity that you hold. When there's already one who has died and said, look at my hands and look at my feet and see how much I love you. You can know him as he knows you. No other God in this world died to save us. Only Jesus, and that alone should merit more than just a cursory glance at Christianity. Don't sell yourself short. You're worth more than that. And if you were of no value, then that cross would have remained empty. You are valuable because he says you are valuable. So don't sell yourself short. Let's pray. Father God, as we enter this time of invitation, I do pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that they would come forward and allow us to minister to them. Lord, if there's a brother or sister in here who's been struggling, who's been going through a difficult time, maybe they find themselves turning to knockoffs yet again, that they're afraid to turn back to you, that they they, they almost picture you standing there tapping your foot with your arms crossed, thinking they're coming back to an angry and, and malicious father when really... Your arms are wide open, eager to receive them. Lord, help us to see you truly for who you are and not allow the knockoffs to dictate the image that is conjured up when we think of you. You are nothing like them. You are showing yourself through the Exodus. You are nothing like any other God. Maybe we are disappointed in ourselves, but you are there ready to receive us. And if there's anyone here who is struggling with that, allow us, Father, to work with them and to help them to see the truth of your word. Father, convict our hearts as we move forward that we would be drawn to you, grow grow closer to you, make very clear the knockoffs in our life, that we would cast them aside and bend our knee only to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.